it's great to be here. It's a very unusual setting for me. I'm used to playing in big uh, venues like this in front of lots of people, but obviously the environment's uh, fairly different. I'm usually playing very loud, pretty uh, hardcore music to a pretty raucous crowd. So if anyone does just want to sort of start throwing some chairs around or start a mosh pit, it would make me feel much more at home. <laughs> Um, obviously, don't really do that. It'd be completely inappropriate and probably quite dangerous. Um, I, uh, I want to talk today a little bit about uh, my journey to becoming a recording artist um, and an experience I had during that journey that led me into the world of education and to become involved with a project that I'm very passionate about. Um, and I hope you'll find it interesting. When I left school, I headed up to Manchester to start a degree and I was set to study history of art for three years. Um, but I knew pretty much from day one, the minute I stepped off that train, that I was never going to finish that course. And the reason for that was because I had become completely obsessed with everything to do with music. Up in Manchester, I met my uh, now business partner, the Chase of Chase and Status. Um, his name's Saul, not Chase, I call him Saul. And we, we hit it off immediately because, just like me, Saul was not interested really in his degree, but he was obsessed with music and everything about it. And it wasn't long before, predictably, we, we bombed out of university in our first year. We failed miserably. And we had some very difficult phone calls to, to individually make to our mums, who had single-handedly slaved away for the last 20 years to give us a, a very privileged, very expensive education to get us to university in the first place. So it was a difficult phone call to make. And I, I remember where I was vividly. I, I was up in student halls, probably fa fairly pale complexion. And uh, I called up my mum and I said, yeah, hey, mum, like, they've got some bad news. That like, uni's not really going to work out for me. Like, I've taken the decision to drop out. But don't worry, I've got a plan. And I proceeded to tell her about my plan to become a DJ. Now, <laughs> didn't go down that well. My mum didn't say much. She did make a noise that I'll never forget. It was a kind of mix of a, a crying and a scream and a howl, uh, if you can imagine that, just all in one. Um, and I knew, obviously, she was concerned. Well, me and Saul, we, we stayed in Manchester. We loved the city. And we, just, we got sort of jobs wherever we could to make ends meet, like any struggling musician would. And in our spare time, we tried to uh, access and, and get into the music industry, this industry we were fascinated and, and loved. And we would do anything to do that. We would promote nights, we'd hang out at record shops, hang out around DJs and clubs, do whatever it took. And, and bit by bit, we made some progress up there, and we made some music that some people thought was good, and we had some small releases, and and we, we started to climb up the ladder of the music industry. This was what we looked like back then. You can see we took things very seriously, always hard man poses on. Um, around this same time, I managed to land uh, a really great job uh, teaching in a, in a large sixth form college in the, in the heart of Manchester. Uh, and I would go on to spend two years teaching um, 16, 17 year olds music production, music technology. Uh, to, to young people from some of the toughest backgrounds, from some of the toughest parts of the city. They came from very different backgrounds to that of my own. And these two years were very inspiring for me. I, I was blown away by the talent that I saw uh, day in, day out, these young people. Um, and I got very excited at their prospects. I was thinking, wow, if these, if these guys are 16, already doing this level of work, and here's me, sort of 23 by now, having success, what's going to happen to these young people? And I became very excited at uh, their prospects. So I did this for two years, and then me and Saul, we left, we left Manchester. We moved back to London to pursue our own dreams and really try and go for it. And by now, we started to, to our dreams became a reality. We started to play shows like this, and we got paid to travel the world and do what we love doing and work with amazing people. And I stayed in touch with most of my students. I was very eager to see where were their journeys taking them. And the more I spoke with them, the more, more disheartened I got because none of them were realizing their potential the same way I was. And this really bothered me. I'd seen how great these kids were. And I was doing well. Why weren't they doing well too? 
And it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated question with probably a very complicated answer, but to try and answer it, I thought back at my time with these kids at school from 16 to 19, critical time for them in, in their lives. And I thought about the school that I taught at, and it was a great school, great teachers who were very passionate and cared greatly for, for the students there. But like all media courses and all art courses and music courses in state schools, they're poorly funded and they're poorly resourced which means the computers were always breaking, there weren't enough musical instruments, the studios weren't fit for purpose. There was also very little development of the personal skills these young people would actually need when they left school to get into an industry like the music industry. The syllabus was a bit redundant. It, it didn't feel like it kept up with the changing nature of the music industry. Projects felt dated. Um, and there weren't really any partnerships with any musical organizations in Manchester. There's tons of great companies, organizations in Manchester, and the school didn't really have any proper solid partnerships. So I spoke to my brother about this. Um, my brother was working in education at the time for a great company called Teach First. And I said, look, I want to I do something to address this. This has really bothered me. Um, and we started hashing out ideas. Uh, how we could address this issue, around, specifically around wasted talent um, and young people not coming from the best backgrounds, having the best starts in life. Why is their talent sometimes wasted? So we started hashing our ideas on the, literally the back of a napkin, small projects that we could do that might change things. And we spoke to anyone that would listen to us sort of drone on about this, these ideas, and we got some great feedback. People seemed really positive in what we were talking about. And they gave us some more feedback and, and some more support and more ideas. And suddenly that napkin became uh, an A4 piece of paper. And we spoke to some more people. Suddenly we were speaking to leading teachers. We were speaking to executives from YouTube, from Spotify, from Universal. We were speaking to MPs. We were speaking to recording artists. All of them saying the same thing, giving us massive confidence that we would onto something. They all agreed with us that the best people need to be able to access the music industry or the creative industries, regardless of their background. And this momentum over the course of 18 months transformed uh, the back of a napkin into a 200-page application to the Department for Education to open a free school in the heart of East London. And in 2014, East London Arts and Music was born. This is me and my brother. We're this is a breaking ground photo where we've been procured a, a plot of land by the government, bought us a plot of land in, in East London to build a school, and a year and a half later, this, this building was built. Um, Elam is a 16 to 19 state-funded free school. It's free to attend like any other state school. It specializes in music and everything to do with music, specializes in games design, and it specializes in film and television, so a big facet of the creative industries. When I talk about the creative industries, I'm talking about the thousands of jobs that sit behind the people you see on screens, the people you hear on the radio, um, the thousands of people involved with the creative industries, so people at record labels, producers, technicians, live event managers, um, illustrators, the thousands and thousands of jobs involved, and Elam, serves that, those creative industries. It's, it, Elam lives in Tower Hamlets, the borough of Tower Hamlets, which has the highest rate, one of the highest rates of child poverty in the country, which is significant for us. It's also a very diverse borough, which is important, and it has a very rich musical and artistic heritage. If you come to Elam as a young person, you are learning what it takes to get into the creative industries. You are learning about the type of person you need to be to thrive there. You're learning about relevant skills you will need to use there. What you're not doing is you're not just there to get a piece of paper or, or a qualification. You are getting qualifications, you're getting the highest ones you can get at Eatland, but you're not just there for that. The, the, I've seen it in, in, in practice. The creative industries, they don't actually care too much about those qualifications. Unlike law or medicine, they don't really care so much about those. Um, now the problem is, the way schools are set up, they find it hard to provide 
all of that training to a young person. They shouldn't be expected to. Elam can't do that on its own. They haven't got the capacity, they don't have the know-how. Schools are too busy trying to deliver the curriculum and get young people through those important qualifications. They are trying to provide care for the hundreds, if not thousands, of young people that come through their doors. This is really difficult in itself. They're doing this usually, all state schools are doing this on a very tight budget. So schools like Elam, creative schools, they need industry experts, they need partners, they need professionals to come in and shape that experience for the young person there. And that could be anything, that could be uh, advising on how a building looks, it could be how a classroom interacts, it could be um, how courses are designed and assessed and delivered, it could be um, the, la the type of language used by people in that, in that building. This is one of our partners, Universal Music. They do a lot of this shaping. Uh, they affect a lot of the experience of young people in many different ways, and the effects are profound for our young people. This is the interesting bit for me. This is the really exciting bit, the interaction between the private sector, the world of work, in this case, the creative industries, and the world of education, in this case, schools like Elam. If you get it right, amazing things happen. Everyone wins. The work done in the school becomes massively relevant. The outcomes for trainees becomes tangible. Coursework can even become commercial. And engagement from everyone goes through the roof. This is a small example, uh, one of many at the school. This was in our second year. Some trainees of ours made a song, part of a songwriting unit. They made a great song. And they used one of our partners to set up a record label. And they figured out a marketing strategy and a distribution strategy. And they figured out how to pitch to radio, just like a top record label would. Because of this, the song got picked up by Radio 1. Uh, Mr. Jam is a famous DJ, and he started playing it a lot. And it got streamed on Spotify and YouTube hundreds of thousands of times. Now, this piece of schoolwork, the outcome for that piece of schoolwork, was that the trainees that made it, they got paid. They got paid money for a piece of work they're doing at school. Our partners got paid money. Of course, they got a distinction for the work. I don't think they even knew by the end of it they were doing just some coursework for a qualification. That's the exciting bit for me. That's the marker. That should be the measure. It should be the benchmark that we aspire to. What would, what would the best in the business say about some coursework? What would the best in the business say about this young person, this trainee? If a young person leaves somewhere like Elam and they don't want to go to university, are they industry ready? Will they thrive in the industry? And if not, why not? It's, it's really complex actually doing this, um, interacting, partnering schools with the private sector, getting companies to work alongside schools in this, in this way, at this level. It's really difficult to do that because um, there's massive safeguarding issues. Companies are really nervous of working with schools which are full of young people under 18. That's understandable. There aren't very good systems and processes in place to, to, to help that transaction uh, run smoothly. Um, at Elan, we do that by being innovative, the way we think about those partnerships. We do it by being really flexible. We do it by being open-minded. We do it by being grateful for opportunities we get and by always showing that the opportunities our partners give us are mutually beneficial. As our outcomes for our trainees gets better, so do the outcomes for our partners. I'm proud to say uh, Elam's doing, doing well. It received an outstanding rating in its first Ofsted uh, inspection. We've helped, uh, we've inspired and helped open another school called the London Screen Academy, which is a fantastic film school uh, with some of the biggest backers from the film industry. And I hope that by showing um, the benefit of the creative industry coming together with creative schools, we can better the creative industries of tomorrow, and most importantly, the lives of many young people. Thank you very much.